you want a drastic change, you got to have a drastic step. You can't just keep like tiptoeing like, oh, I should do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Like, I mean, yeah, it's uncomfortable, like, but it's strong. It, it makes you more powerful, like hiking the trails, like it makes you stronger. A movement is underway of people abandoning the emotional, physical, and financial expenses of city living and crafting their own purpose, livelihoods, and joy in the rural reaches. The Urban Exodus podcast shares the wisdom, wit, and stories of those who decided to embark on the road less traveled to pursue their own interpretation of the good life. Small business owners, change makers, artists, farmers and more, working towards building a better future for themselves and their fellow citizens. This podcast is for country dreamers, rural folk, and urban dwellers alike who want to feel more connected to the natural world and the purpose and choices in their lives. I'm Melissa Hessler. Welcome to the Urban Exodus. I'm excited to invite you to my conversation with Daniel White, a modern day trailblazer. Daniel grew up in the city, but deep down, he's always had a desire to live closer to the natural world. In his mid twenties, he took a job as an electrician and spent over a half a decade working 60 plus hour work weeks. At 31, he boarded his first airplane and immediately got the travel bug. He would spend any time that he had off going to far off places, sometimes with just a few dollars in his pocket. After a bad breakup, he decided to quit his job, cash out his 401k in savings, and hike the Appalachian Trail. He had no training, and his first time sleeping in a tent was on the trail. Daniel began documenting his experience online for his friends and family, and he started to amass a following of supporters who helped him stay the course and hike all the way from Georgia to Maine. After that transformative 190-day journey, Daniel continued his adventures, biking the 2,000-mile Underground Railroad Trail, hiking Scotland and Spain from coast to coast, and most recently, the island of Dominica. Perhaps his biggest adventure and challenge to date, though, is realizing the dream he and his late father shared. Through contributions from his online community, Daniel was able to purchase 10 acres of land in northern Maine. He is working on his vision of a community homestead of tiny houses for like-minded folks who wish to enjoy a lifestyle outside of the confines of the city. Daniel's story is one of tenacity, self-reliance, courage, and the endless pursuit of adventure. Daniel is such an uplifting human being who is inspiring his community to believe in themselves and to work towards their own goals. I really hope you enjoy it. I would love if you shared a little bit of your personal backstory, kind of uh, your younger years and maybe even to where you are now. Well, my name is Daniel White. I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, Uh, known now as like a pretty hip mountain town and everything. Uh, Back then, I I had no clue about hiking outdoors, mountains, or anything like that. You know, just growing up, going to school, uh, young black kid, that's all, you know, that's all I knew. Uh, Got into a little trouble once I, you know, I quit school at at 16, Uh, wasn't challenging anymore stuff like that. So I just, I just quit school, kind of went and did my own thing. I went and got my GED in like a week. Uh, but then, you know, once again, just being bored and being from a certain place in Asheville, you know, middle class, not lower income, but middle class, um, young and dumb, getting into some trouble, you know, doing the wrong things, making bad decisions, uh, led me to catch some charges at the age of like 19, uh, for possession of crack cocaine, went on probation, did that type of thing, uh, Went and got a job at a nursing home. I worked there for like three years, uh, from like 22 to 25. Uh, but the thing is, I had stopped going to check in with probation and everything because it was just the thought of going to prison was like, eh, I'm trying to avoid that. So um, 
It's one of those avoidance things, you know, sometimes I, I, I have an issue with that. But anyways, 25, I uh, went to prison. Uh, so I spent my 25th birthday in prison. Did eight months, got out, moved to Charlotte uh, from Asheville. And uh, I, I, my neighbor was an electrician. Uh, so I started working with him, being an apprentice with him. And I just picked it up. And, and from there, uh, age of 25 to the age of, I guess, 30, 31, that's all I was doing, working every day. But uh, got on with the company, you know, so I was making an okay job. That was a good bounce back from, you know, uh, prison to being an electrician. So, you know, I, you got to be happy there. But uh, just working, being overworked 60 hours a week, uh, you being pushed to, to do that job. And it just, I guess, the burnout that happened after so long, uh, just working them long days, long hours, uh, just needed something different. I had never been traveling and anything like that in my life. So I remember catching a, a, a plane uh, to Puerto Rico for three days. You know what I'm saying? I had like a hundred bucks uh, in my pocket for three days. You know what I mean? And, uh, matter of fact, they took 50 of it when I went to check into the room for a deposit. So I had 50 bucks to last off for three days till I checked out of my uh, hotel. Uh, but we made it work, you know, slipped on the beach the first night. And I think that was like my first little adventure. It's like sense of adventure, I guess. Uh, so I went from there. Start catching flights because, you know, I was making OK money, you know, being an electrician. So uh, being able to catch flights here and there. Uh, and then my boss was like taking a lot of vacations. I said, well, you know, I, you know, I never been nowhere. You know, it's like I'm 31. I just now been on a plane at 31. So uh, he's like, yeah, but, you know, sometimes your dreams aren't what's best for you. You know, uh, so I'm like, OK. So I think like a week later, I put in my two week notice and, and cashed out my 401k, took all the penalties, all that kind of good stuff with no direction where I was going to do next. But I started, like, I went and bought, like, some construction uh, equipment, like, to make, um, like, benches and, and do some woodwork. I was like, I'm going to teach myself how to do woodwork. So I made a few benches and stuff, and, you know, I had a couple sales here and there. Um, but, you know, just wanting to get something else fulfilling, I guess. Um, then, like, this was, like, 2016, uh, late 2016. So it's, like, an election year. You're seeing all this election propaganda. So that's, like, weighing on me heavy. I'm um, just seeing the division in the country, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, well, bad stuff. Um, just seeing all that going on. Uh, been through a bad breakup. My ex moved on the same street. Uh -huh. So I had to ride to a job that I hated past her house, you know, uh, and see uh, the new boyfriend's car parking drive. So it was like, yeah, right, man, I need a break. So I think I just, I just posted one day. On Facebook, uh, I wonder if I can survive in the woods. Just a random thought, you know, from probably me watching like Man vs. Wild or something like that. And uh, my cousin said, uh, go hike the Appalachian Trail. So from, I looked it up, uh, got online, did my YouTubes, did my Googles and everything. Like, oh, this looks like something pretty cool. And I'm like, wait, people like actually walk in the woods for 2,000 miles and you can stay out here and always places to stay. And oh, they got shelters along the way. Once I start learning more about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do this. I can at least try it or uh, whatever. So um, like three months later, here I am starting a new journey uh, on the Appalachian Trail um, from something that I never knew. I never been hiking, camping. I didn't sleep in my tent until the first day I was hiking the trail, you know. So it was just something totally new. But I knew I needed something different, a whole different way because I was just burnt out, burnt out so much from my way of life, like depressed and just, yeah, it was a lot. So what better way than to go walk in the woods for a few months? So uh, I started loving it as I'm as I'm hiking the journey through hiking from Georgia to Maine, uh, and I'm I'm thinking at first I'm only gonna do four or five hundred miles. You know I didn't have much money saved up at that point. I had been catching my flights with my 401k. I've been you know just having a good time, um, but I was able to spend gear, and then I didn't know how expensive gear was, and you know I didn't have a concept of how expensive hiking the trail would end up being. So once I got like right around the Great Smoky Mountains, which is about a little bit after 200 miles in. Right around when I got to the Smokies, I started to run out of money a little bit. So uh, I put up a GoFundMe. I was doing YouTube videos uh, starting off, you know, and it was just a few people watching. It started to get a little traction, I guess. And I put up a GoFundMe and uh, I put the, the limit to like 500 bucks, you know, because people like family and friends were asking me like, how could I help you, you know? I like this, what you're doing is pretty cool. How could I help? Can I send you something? But I'm like, nah, y'all probably try to send like, cans of spam that I don't want to carry on my back. You know, it's heavy. Uh, so just send some money. So I, I put the GoFundMe to 500 and the next day it was at, it was over 500. Um, mostly from people that watch my YouTube from strangers and stuff. So I'm like, oh wow, 
uh, yeah, I probably should keep going. Uh, so that was the start of me, like, actually through hiking the trail. Before then, I had only planned on being out for a couple months until my money ran out. But once I feel like people were invested in me like that and people were like, oh, actually, like, rooting for me, then I was like, I felt obligated to keep pushing. And also, I was already kind of in love with the trail. I didn't want to go home, so uh, which is why I spent 190 days hiking that one. Um, so... From hiking the AT, uh, I just tried to keep it keep it going. Where you know uh, another journey next year, 2018, I, I biked the uh, Underground Railroad Trail uh, from Alabama to Canada. So that was a different, like heavy type of trip because it was history attached to it, and I was passing through historical sites and riding past cotton fields in Alabama, which like a you know just puts you in a mind state, and it's like, well. I'm able to ride through on this expensive bike with all the newest gear and food and nobody's chasing me and I'm free, quote unquote. And um, I'm, I'm just, it's a whole different journey thinking about what some of maybe my ancestors would have had to make trying to get up north on the Underground Railroad. Um, just being chased by dogs and stuff like that in the middle of the night and have to navigate by the stars and stuff like that. So it was just different having to have those feelings. So that was a totally different trip. But it was powerful, um, you know, and I, I got to share that with everyone. So that was that was good to bring bring people along because it's it's not a well known trail. Um, it's a biking trail. I didn't see anyone else doing it while I was doing it. Uh, it took me forty nine days to do, um, a lot quicker than that hundred and ninety on the uh, Appalachian. Um, but just a different journey. Uh, so then next year I was able to uh, go to Scotland and hike coast to coast across Scotland, TGO Challenge, which was a totally different terrain and and different type of adventure um, and just being able to meet the people. I'd never been out of the country before then. And um, then I went back a month later and hiked the Camino, uh, basically coast to coast in Spain, uh, the Northern coast, um, which is like a more of like a, a pilgrimage route, route. And they got like 12 different routes that all lead to Santiago de Compostela, which is a major uh, church. So it's just a big pilgrimage site. Um, it's really cool, really powerful journey. And it's just, it's just a beautiful journey. So be able to just do that back to back. Um, and and that's what I've been doing. Just trying to keep going year after year and trying to inspire, inspire people that you can try to figure it out and just keep just traveling and, and moving around. And it, it kind of enriches your life. It makes the world smaller. You get to meet different people along the way. And, um, you know, you never know when you're running to them again. You know, it kind of just it's you just you never know. You make sure your, your network big. You know, the world is, you know, and there's people that travel a lot more than we do, you know. Um, so it's just good to be able to get out. So from then, I, I this year I was able to uh, go to Dominica and kind of switch up the vibes. I've never been down to the Caribbean and uh, hike uh, from all across the island. They have a, a national trail there, White Kabuli National Trail, which is actually the indigenous name of the island. Uh, so it was a blessing to be able to go down there, and I was able to partner with uh, Moose Jaw and take some gear down there for the kids and be able to donate some money back to uh, some of the locals there to help uh, because they had a really bad hurricane a few years ago that is still uh, evident on the island. So, you know, all the help, you know, is needed. And I think sometimes we tend to forget about smaller places like that, you know, um, you know, because like Puerto Rico got hit really hard, but it's like a ton of islands right there next to that, too. So I think it's just always important. And I, and I was able to do that with the connection from social media from my friend Chev. Uh, Dixon. Uh, so just being able to network in this community, the outdoor community, and try to just, you know, now I'm traveling for a, a purpose now, I think more. Um, so when I want to go a place now, I'm thinking about what I can do to maybe uh, give back or help as well, because I'm over here providing, I'm over here having fun, I'm over here enjoying your country or your trail or whatever it is. So it's only right that I, I break bread too, you know, if, if, if at all possible. So, um, just trying to move forward in that. And I guess my latest venture now is just working on Zion North. Uh, we, we're here now. Uh, I was able to purchase 10 acres of land. We crowdfunded 10 acres of land. Um, so, you know, and, and now we're going to start a community homestead. So I just wanted to get up here. I've been up here for five months uh, as of day before yesterday. And uh, 10 acres of raw land. We're just going to build a few different tiny houses all along the property. Uh, we're going to get us some animals up here. we get us some crops going and, and I want people to just come and live freely. You know, I want to invite people up here to just come and enjoy a different type of lifestyle. And it's not money based or anything like that. As long as we got seeds and as long as we got 
crops growing and animals and you're really willing to come put in some work and uh, get it going, then, you know, you're always welcome here. You know, it's a, just a, a different different type of thing, I guess. Um, and it, it's gone because I just about got my tiny house finished. So uh, it's, it's been a lot of work, but it's just been a process and it's been a blast to be able to try to bring everybody along and, and you know, keep people motivated to, to want to be a part of something like this. One thing that I find so inspiring about you and what you're sharing about your life, you've kind of gotten over this fear that like society has kind of shoved down our throats, like fear of starting new, fear of messing up. We all have so many fears that it kind of keeps us from our happiness. And I wondered how you really tapped into that part of you when you were working that nine to five job. What like told you inside that it was time to go and it was time to start something new? Uh, it was just a feeling. Cause you know, if you don't like something, it's like you get to the, like, that was like your lowest point. It felt like, like my lowest point. So I had to do something, you know, I don't know what, if, if I didn't do something, I, don't, I, I would hate to think, you know, what would happen. So it's like, I had to do something and it's like, why not something extreme? I don't know what made led me to the Appalachian Trail. It's like, it's really weird that, cause I, I never been hiking or anything like that. You know, I like fishing, you know, and stuff like that. I like the outdoors. Like I said, I like those shows. I love watching those shows, but the thought of me hiking that, it never crossed my mind. So I don't know where it came from. I think that there are so many people who feel the way that you felt in that moment, like on a day-to-day basis. And It can be extremely hard, obviously, to just uproot your life and creature comforts and kind of systems of convenience that you're used to and like put yourself in a really uncomfortable position and have to push through that. What advice do you have for people who like see your life and they go, wow, you're living my dream life, but then they feel like this could never be possible for them? You got to take like a step. I mean, you got to take some type of like drastic step. It takes that sometimes. If you want a drastic change, you gotta have a drastic step. You can't just keep like tiptoeing, like, oh, I should do it tomorrow, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. Like, I mean, yeah, it's uncomfortable, like, but it's strong, it, it makes you more powerful. Like hiking the trails, like it makes you stronger. Like the stronger, the longer that you go on the trail, it's all it's all metaphorical. So it's like, it's all mental. It's, it's more a mental thing because people of all body types, ages, heights, it, like that doesn't matter. It's just everybody's on the same plateau. It's just all mental. Like how much pain and suffering can you take until you build your body up to be able to make it through these climbs without suffering as much and and get used to the bad weather and stuff like that. Days of that it might and it's gonna take that. So you know it might you you might not want to do nothing extreme as through hiking the trail. I mean that's cool you know, but it's always steps that you can take you know. Um, because climbing the mountains, they just take step after step after step. It's not like you're not jumping up to the top of the mountain. So it's, it's just that. So the other thing about the Appalachian Trail, and I'm wondering if a lot of the ideas for Zion North, if those came through that reconnection with the earth and paying attention, I think that, you know, hiking is one thing, but if you're in the wilderness for like 14 plus days, you start to notice things that regular human beings don't notice. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that experience and that slowing down to what maybe our ancestors' rhythms were more like with the earth oh for sure um you definitely can smell the rain like um like even like since i've been up here like i said five months i've just been watching the patterns of the wind and everything i know how the wind moves i know how if it's something is off you know um i can just kind of feel it you just pay attention a little more Uh, your senses get a little sharper i think just because they need to be when you're out in the woods they need to be a little sharper so where you don't kick a rock and stumble and fall down this hill you know what i mean so it, it could be it could be bad um so I think the further you hike and the more you go, you, you get a little bit more in tune. Uh, for sure, like you get back wild. I think like a little bit, uh, cause at first people are like filtering their water, all the through hikers, all the, you know, but like you might see somebody 800 miles down the way, they're not filtering water. They're like, they dropped off half of their gear, you know, like they got the wild beard, you know, it's just like, it's a totally different thing. Um, and then when, once you make it to, by the time you make it all the way up to Katah, and it's like, you barely got anything left, you know, you just got a jacket and it's like, you're just really wild and feral now almost. So, um, 
Yeah, you definitely get more in tune. Uh, and it definitely led me here because once I got up to Maine, I seen how beautiful it was and how untouched it was and just how wild it was. Um, and that's what I was thinking the whole entire Appalachian Trail was going to be. I didn't know it was going to be such a huge community thing, which was cool. Um, but I thought it was just going to be this wild thing. And I'm just out here hiking by myself and walking through the trees and that's it, and walking up on top of mountains and stuff. But it's on like a certain section that you really get over tree line, which is like in New Hampshire. And um, then the really wild section up here, like the 100 mile wilderness uh, in Maine. So that's the like really untouched with no services or anything like. So um, it definitely led me here. And then the community aspect led me here because stopping up in Maine, they had like a, a place to come. You uh, make like a, you stop down at, the, at this little uh, dock and you call it um, on the walkie talkie and they come pick you up on a boat and drive you up the river. By the time you get up there, you probably like wet because they got the little boat and you got all this gear and they got three, four hikers in there and they're flying on the uh, little river, but he knows the river like the back of his hand because if you don't, you probably like hit something. They got these little, uh, you know, like stuff, rocks and stuff sticking out. And so it's really cool. Then they take you to like this little private oasis that they built back there and it's like bunk houses and it's like a main like big log cabin they serve you like nice blueberry breakfast and blueberry pancakes and stuff and it's like really cool and i was like oh yeah, this is really nice you know um so yeah i don't have the river here but it's close enough um to to what i want to what i want to try to create and who's to say i may not find another couple acres down the road here or there you know because you know not a lot of people want to live in northern maine so the, the land is kind of affordable here so that's great um but they don't know it's like so many pluses to living in maine you know um so that's I, that's why i enjoy it enjoy it up here and that's what what, what kind of made me choose it like just the whole aspect of the high community and, and not to and not to mention the international appalachian trail is like five minutes from here it's actually the main road so anytime i go to town or leave from here i'm on the international appalachian trail so that's a that's a plus. Maybe one day we'll turn this place into uh, have a hostel space here. You know, I want to have a place where we put a little hostel. Um, so and there's not many hikers that do the International Appalachian Trail. So it'd be cool to just be able to house them here if they ever do happen to come this way. You know, and maybe 20 years down the road, there might be a destination for hikers. And um, in a few years, I want to build some bunk houses here to have some kids uh, be able to come up here with their parents and everything for the summer and be able to stay here the summer and just like learn wilderness skills. We had some um, target practice and uh, learn how to farm and beekeeping. And um, just as more people come, we'd be able to add more, you know, more things and maybe rock climbing, maybe we build a rock climbing wall here, you know? So I think we, it can be whatever we want it to be. You know, it's just what we envision. I mean, 10 acres is a lot of land and I don't need 10 acres by myself, so. Zion North, to me, it's such a beautiful vision. And I think that the reason that, you know, you've built this community of people who are supporting you and really excited about what you're doing is that real, like, truth and purpose in you. I wondered when this vision came into light. Like, when was that moment that it just popped up and you're like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look for acreage closest to this part of Maine and figure out, like, that you are going to follow through with this purpose, this plan. I mean, I guess I, the original idea spawned from just, you know, sitting, chopping up my, my dad at the kitchen table, you know, talking about family compound, you know, like, what we would grow, you know, uh, what type of dogs we would have, this, type, you know, that and third, just brainstorming, just, you know, um, just for conversation. Uh, but I think he, he had it flawed a little bit because he just thought about like the family. But I don't think the the total family is want to want to stay on the compound or live that type of lifestyle. Like someone may want to go live in the city, you know, so um, I think it was better to find just like minded people. So I always had that in my head. So I don't know. I mean, the idea spawned from that and just like I said, from my road trip and um, just just thinking about it just and just from from the AT, like I always wanted to do something like this because I seen, like I said, from the AT when that one, I got to the to the place in the 100 mile wilderness that brought you on the boat um, and that type of thing. So it was just, I don't know, a culmination of, of all those different things. But last year I had the idea and I just put up the GoFundMe um, in like June and, you know, here we are in June, June of next year, I was here. So uh, I came up here in February and I looked at the property. It was covered in three or four feet of snow. 
<laughs> you know, I only walked like about to where we are now. And I looked around, I was like, oh, this is nice. And I, um, I seen moose uh, tracks everywhere and I was like, okay. And then I went down to town and it was, I was passing people on like snowmobiles and stuff. And uh, I went in there and I put a down uh, down payment on the, on the property. You know, I, I put a hold on it and closed in like 30 days. And yeah, sight unseen really, uh, as far as like when it was thawed out. Uh, so I just came up here in, in mid-June, June 20th, and this whole entire place was basically just like brush and thick brush. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next day I tried to get out with my little hand tool, my little sickle, and I tried to like cut me a little pathway up. And I was like, after like 10 minutes of that, I was like, nah, this is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I waited. The next day I went and bought me a brush cutter with a metal blade. Yeah, I made me a nice path up through here, and I got up here, and I start looking around, and I said, uh, I'm going to need a chainsaw. So, um, yeah, it's just been a process. Calling all small and rurally-based business owners. Do you love Urban Exodus and want to help support our continued programming? Become a founding partner of the new Urban Exodus shop. You can reach an engaged customer base who believes in supporting farmers, makers, artisans, and small business owners in rural economies. We are looking for culinary delights, home goods, body goods, art, textiles, adornments, more. We just are really interested to see what you're creating and try to help you get it out there to a larger audience. And we're looking for vendors who make quality products, who pay a living wage, and who run sustainably minded operations. And if this sounds like you and your business and you want to learn more, please click the partnerships page on urbanexodus.com. So you created a GoFundMe. So the community that you've created, who's been inspired by you taking these big adventures to places and helping people, they came together to make this dream a reality. What does it feel like to have that sort of support that isn't even like, you know, maybe a lot of these people you've never met before? What does that mean to you? Oh, it's, it's, it's special. Um, it's special. It's like, it seems like, it's like a lot of responsibility too, you know, um, but it's worth it. Cause like, and it's like, I'm, I'm grateful every day. Cause like people been like, since I, even since I've been here, um, people send things like the cot and this chair that I'm sitting in, like to try to help, and they want to just be a part of the journey. So um, it's important for me to it, it keep me motivated to keep going. That's one, um, you know, just the fact that they rock with me. Like, you know, who gives somebody money to buy land? Like everybody want to buy land. Like you know, and I used to get comments like that from some people that was like, oh, I don't, you know, but it's like I, I get it why you be mad or upset, but I think people just really want to see something like believe in the dream and believe something that is, is possible and it's cool, you know, and they may not be in a uh, position to leave their job right now, but they can help pitch in and try to see this thing through. So like, that's really cool. Um, you know, I got people that probably donate like once a month, you know, and they're like, Oh, you know, this is my donation, my, my monthly donation. So that's a cool thing to have people that invested in something that we're trying to create here. And then, um, I think the fact that every step of the way is I've, I've been able to keep make it happen and keep it going, you know, because like some people probably wouldn't believe that I would be able to raise the money to even buy the property. Or you know, like I was like, OK, I want to do it 10 acres. I want it like this. This is how I want it. I want it in northern Maine or Colorado or here or there. And then I started to narrow my choices down because on my road trip, I went and checked out some spots in Colorado and Oregon and in. Uh, Northern California, and th but they just was, they didn't match up. You know, it's like, okay, well, I got the risk of um, wildfire here. Um, they're way more like rugged spots, so it's no like power or water or anything. So it's just going to be a little bit different. The climate is different. A lot of it was desert. So then a lot of it was, and if it wasn't desert, it was way more expensive than what I was trying to raise. I only put the GoFundMe to 25000 So um, that's not a lot of money to think you're going to get 20, 10 acres with, you know. Um, but here in Maine, it works, you know, and it's rugged, but I still got a Walmart 10 minutes away. Uh, I still got an actual little small town with a movie theater 10 minutes away. Um, but I'm still almost, it feels like I'm in the middle of nowhere. It's not much traffic. It's no light pollution or anything. Um, 
like the sky seems a little bit closer like everything's good it's got good stars and stuff uh i've been looking out to see if i can maybe see the uh the uh, northern lights here um i know i think i got a chance up this far so just things like that and it's unrestricted i can kind of maneuver and do the things i need to do on it um as far as the community homestead aspect of it so it's just been really cool to be able to come get the land come check it out bring people along the whole process for me even driving up here to even check the land out you know and um just the entire, yeah, from getting up here and, and raising the money and getting here and being able to get the 10 acres, like I said, and um, just carry through with what I what I said I was going to do, the original plan. So, like, I just wanted to, like I said, I wanted to show people this, this season, this year, look, this is what it could be. It's not hard to build a tiny house. I mean, it was tough. It was really tough. But you got to put it to people like that so they'll be, you know, you got to psych people into believing in themselves sometimes, you know. You got to... That's how I do it. You know, I kind of suck myself out. I just sit here. I listen to all these like crazy um, horror stories about wilderness beasts um, kidnapping people and stuff all day. All night. And I just got like a, uh, a blanket right now. I don't even have a door. I just put the blanket up over top of the, where the door opening is. And but, you know, nothing, nothing's grabbed me yet. And then I, and I sleep pretty good. So, you know. That's so funny. That actually ties into a question that I wanted to ask you because it was something that we talked about last time that like I haven't stopped thinking about. And that is the fear that is like so pervasive in our society. It's fear that separates us from one another. It's fear that prevents us from going into certain places that feel like maybe they're off limits to us. It's fear of making change. It's fear of taking back control of your own life and livelihood. We just have all of these kind of fears. And I wondered where you think that those come from or how they have become so pervasive in our our society i would say programming that's one and then probably inexperience because uh, and probably it starts with the programming which scares you to you know keep you away from places like that um uh, and or misinformation stuff like that to keep tell you oh this place is dangerous you know people like like i, I keep having the, that's why I, I love showing people from back home that know me they like oh be safe and i'm like look i'm i'm way safer than you you know i may have a chance of a bear or a moose walking through here but it's not trying to kill me you know it's people like in y'all from the city you know it's way more murders it's way more crime th than what i'm living in so it's just inexperience and they don't know you know so it's good for me to be able to show them it's like because everybody's like you know ain't no black people in maine well, I'm here and I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's like, and it's like, oh man, it's, well, it may be like this and then, well, so what? I don't care. What they got to do with my 10 acres? You know, it's like, if, as long as I can go into town and buy stuff from the grocery store and they don't deny me and stuff like that, then it, I think I'll be okay. So it's just that fear of the unknown, uh, what it's going to be and what it's going to be stepping into something new. So it's also good for me to show them like, oh, you can step into the unknown. I never built a house. I never lived in Maine. I never did any of this. I never hiked, I never, you know, but if I can do it, you can do something. You know, I'm not no superhuman, you know. Um, I just like highly determined. You, you might know. be a little bit, like a tiny bit superhuman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just determined. I'm just determined. Like, I'm not going to take no for an answer. Like, that's that's all, you know, so. I'm, and, and I know what my dreams are. And then, like, this is simple. Like, my, my dreams ain't the most complex dreams. Like, I just want to live in the woods and chill and grow my veggies and just kick back, you know, um, that's it. You came into this small town in Holton, Maine, and have you felt welcomed by your community? Have you been making friends with your neighbors? What has that kind of transition looked like for you? Oh, yeah, it's been pretty cool. I know the ladies over at the general store, Miss Phyllis. There's a few ladies over there. I took them some uh, tomatoes that I grew. Uh, I helped my neighbor Gary uh, put on his roof, his metal roof, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I've been meeting them, you know, and they let me come get water when I need water, uh, that type of thing. People been pretty accommodating, especially like right here around where I'm at. Uh, it's a small area. We ain't got nothing but the town hall that's right outside of there. We got the general store close and then uh, right in, in, in the town of Houghton. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's, it's small, you know, but they know me. They're getting used to me now. Uh, I figure they've probably been taking bets to see if I last through the winter, but that's cool. They probably do that with all the, uh, the the people that come from. They definitely do. I'm certain of it. We do it, like, in our town in Maine, too. <laughs> We're like, if they make it through the first winter, then they'll make it. Yeah, because my, my, my neighbor Gary, he's like, 
I, I said, I joked, I said, he probably came over here to do like recon. He came to do recon to let everybody know how, how I'm coming along. So he came over here a few times. Um, but he's cool. Uh, but I know he like, because when he thought I was from Jersey, I told him I was born in Jersey. So the next day I went to town and the um, guy was like, at the cashier, he's like, oh, you the fella from um, Jersey building a tiny house. And I'm like, oh, okay. The last time I was here, you had just hand dug and poured those four sauna tubes behind you. Gosh, when was that? Was that at the end of August? Yeah, like early, mid-August, like mid-August. And now you are sitting in front of your home that you're going to be living in this winter, and you've done it. You've, <laughs> you've constructed a home. What has this process, because I know that it was really important for you to get the first house on Zion North built yourself to like prove the vision and I think that's a big piece of it you know you have to prove that you actually can do it but what I love about you sharing your story is that you aren't sugarcoating what this experience is like because I think that we have these like overly bucolic ideas of living in a rural area and that isn't necessarily the case (laughs) and so I'd love for you to just talk about what the process has been like since I was last here building this house behind you and what you've learned what you've like wish you would have known before like things you had to learn the hard way all of those things oh man uh what's the what's the saying measure twice cut once (laughs) that for sure uh just trying to balance that out Uh, but i did pretty good as far as like material ordering uh i do know you should probably order windows as quick as you can order windows because they want to short you on those but um yeah it's been a process uh for sure just trying to do layer by layer um i just been learning to take it one step at a time uh layer by layer um and trying to make sure my foundation was solid you know and um my main thing on, on this project was trying to over engineer to where it just don't fall apart that was my main thing in my head i don't want it to fall apart and every day i would sit and when I would do something, I would look at it and I say, "How can it fall apart? And how can I stop it from falling apart?" And then the next day, I would do that. And then I look at it some more. And then I, so that was it. Was just the process of that day after day. Um, and then taking a couple of days off for rest because uh, you know, like lifting walls and sheet sheetrock and having to carry it from the bottom of the driveway all up here, and tr- then try to film all this for later. And like it was a lot. And doing doing it all by myself, it was it was cool. It's rewarding. But it's a lot of work. Um, so just uh, just learning to enjoy the process. Take it one day at a time, one step at a time, um, and try to finish one job and, and move on to the next, um, which I got a hard time doing. My brain works a million ways. Like right now, I got the different million things to do on the house. But it's cool because I know what order I need to do them in. I know what needs to be done. So it's just, it's just the way I, I've learned to work. Well, and clearly you have a house behind you so (laughs) Uh, you have made this manifest like in two months you have built a house by yourself like that is absolutely amazing even just the ordering for building a house if you've never built a house before i can't even imagine like we have somebody fixing up a shed on our property right now and it was just like me doing the ordering of the windows and the doors and stuff like just that alone is a lot to like think about about the timing and all of it how did you kind of figure that part out because i feel like there aren't any youtube videos for that oh well i mean i had a lot of time to sit here and think so once i knew i was going to try to do a 10 by 15. I just kind of did it in my head and just ordered a couple extra. And it kind of worked out. How many months were you here camping before you like really figured out the plan for the house and where it was going to sit, where the door is going to be and all of that planning? Oh, I kind of I kind of did all that as I went. Like I didn't have any idea what I was going to do to windows. So I just kind of like well, two right here would be cool because it's a short house. And if I do it like this, and I put one on the, because I wanted to see like where the sun set and where everything went. And I was like, okay. Um, and I just kind of, I just kind of did it from there. Uh, even with the, with the foundation and everything, I was going to do a different foundation, but it's kind of, I had to, I had to go with what I had to go with. So. 
This is your first Maine winter. What are you looking forward to? What are you kind of like dreading or nervous about, if anything? Running out of firewood. That'll be the only thing. But I'm a, uh, I think I'm going to order some couple cores of wood this year. I got a bunch of wood that I could probably use here, but it's it's too fresh. So I need some seasoned wood. Um, and then next year, spring, as soon as this stuff thaws out, then we're trying to get it. We'll try to get it ready and prepared for either use next year or the year after um, and get it seasoned. But yeah, that'd probably be the, the only thing I'm worried about here. Um, I don't think we got no wolf uh, wolf packs running around or anything like that. Or You have your own wolf pack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got a wolf behind me, so she's, she'll be a wolf in like two months. So she'll be able to fight a couple of things off. So yeah, other than that, uh, I think I think it'll be good. I'm just looking forward to watching the snow, kicking back, enjoying the fire, tons of soups. I got a weighted blanket. It's going down. Yeah. Is there any advice you would have given yourself early on in the process that you wish you would know now from like opportunities that came up that were not the right opportunities or like lessons that you wish you would have learned earlier on in your process? Get started earlier. Uh, I think I I wasted a lot of time because I probably always wanted to do this type of stuff, but I was just probably scared to look uncool, whether it be the neighborhood I was living in or a friend group I had or whatever. I just didn't want to step out there so um, I think basically the best thing is trying to just be yourself Um, I always love fishing like I always wanted to be I always love the outdoor shows and stuff like I probably would have been hiking you know um, but it just wasn't the coolest thing to do so now that's why I try to share it with people and make every I try to make everything I do like it's cool you know like it's a cool thing to do you know Um, it's cool to be just peaceful out here just chilling you know and not have to worry about anything um, be able to grow your own food and have like a power over how you eat and how you live. Like that's the coolest thing you could do. Um, but I think it's just the convenience like of America kind of like sucks us out a little bit because we got everything we want at the touch of a touch of a button. So it's like that's a, that's a spoiler. It's a spoiler, you know. Like even if I order something from Amazon, I still got to wait a week up here. Like nothing's coming the next day up here. This, this is. I'm way out, off the, out of the way, so it's cool. It's in, like, my mom, she came up here to visit, and, you know, she was loving it because it gave her a chance to, like, disconnect for a bit, you know, and cut her phone off and just, like, breathe in the air and all that type of good stuff. So I just want people to experience that, whether it be my family, my friends, people I know on social media, people that I met, um, people that I haven't met on social media. Like, it's all good. Like, as uh, long as you bring in the good vibes, you're welcome here. And that's kind of it, because I want you to have this for yourself. You don't have to be 10 acres. You know, um, it could just be one or two acres. You can do it uh, totally different from me, but I'm just showing you like a different way to do things. Um, Yeah, that's all. Honestly, the reason that I'm still doing Urban Exodus is because I think a lot of the people that I've met through the project see in a very similar way to the way that you see. It isn't even necessarily like you have to like move to the middle of the woods, but it is like trying to see a different way and trying to appreciate different things. And I think that our society has distracted us so much and made everything so convenient that we are really, really out of touch with like our basic human needs and essential (laughs) things. And I think that that's making us really unhappy and honestly sick. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Oh, for sure. Uh, I can see that just from the drastic difference in when I just left Dominica. Uh, it's a really small island. It's only 29 miles uh, top to bottom uh, as far as like area. But um, like it's a really diverse island, but everybody is eating fresh. It's only one Kentucky Fried Chicken on the whole entire island. Uh, but other than that, people are eating fresh. They're growing fresh. These old folks are like 70 years old, they're farming, they're farming volcanic land and it's on like a 45 degree angle almost, you know, and it's like, it's amazing to see, you know, but like, and you would think they got a worse quality of life, but in actuality, they don't. They got to seem like a pretty cool quality of life to me. They living in this tropical paradise, eating this fresh fruit every day, eating fresh fish every day, you know, so it's like just a different thing and it's not super convenient. Like, and I had to be, uh, get accustomed to that. Um, just with traveling anywhere outside of the U.S., when you're in smaller places, you kind of got to get accustomed. And even smaller places in the U.S., 
you have to get accustomed to it. Like rural, um, it closed at five. Everything gonna close at five o'clock. Like because when you think about it, what you doing riding around at ten, twelve o'clock at night? Like seriously, <laughs> like what are you doing? Like what are we doing now? Like but maybe that's the old me talking when I was twenty one, twenty three, whatever. Yeah, we out. You know, at, at midnight, whatever, two, three. But now at thirty six, I'm like. I ain't got no reason to be out. Like, I only been out riding around in the dark like once or twice here and it felt weird. Like, what am I doing? It's so dark in the country at night. Like, you can't see anything. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. There's no street lights. So it's like, and then like in the summertime when the brush is all up and like you, you wouldn't be able to see no lights, you know, it's like it's nothing. Like, it's totally dark. It's totally thick. Like, yeah. But I feel like that's the natural rhythms by which, like, we really should live and sleep, right? Like, back in the day, people would sleep with the night and wake in the day. And we've kind of, we've changed that way that people live as well. This is true. This is true. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, working third shift and that. Like, people tell me I'm crazy for living this way of life. I'm like, well, yeah. I could say the same thing, you know, about different ways of life. But I, I think we just all been kind of like... We all been kind of stuck in the in the system. I mean, and I'm I'm just being able to break away from the system and showing people that I don't got much money. Like people be like, "Oh, I me mean, living the life." I'm like, "Well, I've been living outside. I've been living in the tent for like the last couple of months. You know, I I still basically live in this little tiny house that's not done yet. I'm living off donations. I'm like I'm not rich, so it's like I'm not living some fantasy life because someone you know was like, "Well, man, I, I wish I could hit the lottery." And it's like I haven't hit the lottery. It's just like a different thing. It's just priorities. It's just what you want out of life, I think. And then telling people to live in a tiny home, it's not like downsizing. It's like, you got to understand, most apartments in New York City is a tiny home. God, that's so true. A 600 square foot, <laughs> that's not the biggest house. That's not the biggest place. But most people grew up in like 600 square foot apartments, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's just, that's just a, a thing. But it's the way you look at it. When they say tiny house, you can build and you can add on and you can... If you want to build a little extra separate pod for your kids, you can do that and you can make it fun and you can, I mean, it's just different ways. It's whatever you want to do. But once you buy the land, the land is going to be cheap and, you know, um, or hopefully cheaper than cheaper than building a $300,000 house. I think that would be the better thing to do. Um, it gives you more freedom, you know, and you don't have to live on the 30 year mortgage. Y'all can do more traveling, which enriches your life. You know, um, I think it's just. I think it's the, the way of the world. I think the world is changing. And I think more people see it that way uh, than, than not. Like family units aren't super tight anymore. So that gives people the more, the will more to travel and move around, I think. So. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, if you think about your home behind you, it's probably like double the size of like a family apartment in Tokyo. This is true. And so you just got to get kind of creative um, with your design. Uh, and then just figure out what it is that you need in your house because it's a lot of stuff that you got in your house that you don't actually use for a long time. You don't need in the house. You just put it under the house. I built my house on, I built my house up so that way I can just kind of put it up. And, uh, you know, it's just about smart design at this point, you know, and we can learn something from the Japanese when it comes to smart design because I like the way they do things. So I plan on putting like a loft, uh, but I want to use a portal ledge, which is basically the tent they use for climbing big, like uh, rock walls, and they hang that up there. So I want to uh, hang one of them up from my wall, you know, just smart design, and that way I can kind of keep it out the way, put a couch under that, and it's all usable space at this point, uh, you know, so. Uh, yeah, I think you just kind of got to change the way you think about living. It's almost like this. I'm not going to say de-evolution because I think it like working towards a collective consciousness is evolution, right? But we have gotten so off track from that. It felt like actually like our indigenous tribes really functioned in that way. Like it was, you know, the village raised the child, you know, the families, units, but it was like a larger tribe. It wasn't just one family. And I wondered if like, if that is something that you've thought about or studied as well, just the makeups of indigenous tribes living in harmony with the earth. Oh, for sure. Um, just, I mean, just being able to tap in and, and be on the land, like I can feel it, you know? So um, that's, that's the whole community aspect for me. You know, that's why I want to do the community aspect because I know it's going to take the community aspect. I could do something cool up here. I can build a few of these probably in a few years and it might look okay. 
but it, it's not, it's going to be nothing like community and different ideas and different thought processes and oh we should do this and we should do that like that's the point of this like I, I wouldn't even have moved up here like I said if I wanted to just be by myself and be a hermit I probably bought an acre somewhere I would have never told anybody about it I mean, you know, I'll probably just fade off the grid if that's what I was planning to do. But no, this, that's the point. Just is the whole point of it is the community aspect. You want to show people that they can live another way. Yeah. I don't want to stay here for 40 years. I mean, not in this one spot. I'm going to move around, you know, because I'm, I'm going to be hiking. I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to be doing this, that. So I want to move around. So maybe I start a Zion uh, North uh, Pacific Northwest and the Zion South and the Zion Puerto Rico. So that way I just have a place to go. And hopefully it once people see this to be successful, then it, it, we can replicate it in different spots. And I just always have a place to go. Everybody always have a place to go. You know, it's, it'll be self-sustaining at that point. You know, it'll always be a tiny house that's empty there that you can stay in for a few days while you need to. And, oh, you just need to come, man, come help with the uh, weeding of the garden while you're here or whatever, you know, whatever the case. Um, and it'll run itself. You know, as long as you got the right people there, the people that with the same type of vision and just want a peaceful life and willing to put in a little work because uh, each different climate going to take a different amount of work. It's going to take different skill sets. So, you know, um, that's, that's the goal for me uh, long term. I just wanted to give an enormous thank you to all of you listeners who have made contributions toward the production of this podcast. Every season, I spend about 100 hours preparing, writing, editing, interviewing, and distributing the podcast. And I have hard costs for my editor and for those hosting fees. And it really means so much to me that you find enough meaning and value in this podcast to pledge your support and to keep it going. And if you haven't had a chance to contribute, we've made it really easy for you. Just click the support button on the top of Urban Exodus website and pledge any amount that you like. Thank you again. I really couldn't continue to do this work without you. I think it's really interesting because, you know, obviously models like this have happened before, like kind of the commune model in the past, back to the lander movement, kind of had a lot of people moving and building their own structures. I think like the element that I don't see in you is this ego that's associated with it. It's really like it is about trying to prove that there are other ways to live and and trying to give that to people as gifts and you've obviously reached this level right of following of support where you could just sign on with a lot of brand sponsors and people and be promoting you know maybe companies or businesses that you don't actually align with their core values but you've chosen not to you've chosen to go this kind of harder but much truer and purer route and I wonder your just thoughts on that or if you ever are in turmoil about, you know, what's the right decision, what's the right path forward? Oh, no, you always choose the people. I always choose the people. Like, because at the end of the day, I won. This right here, I, if I don't do anything else right in life, though, like I would love to travel and do all that. But if I don't, if I don't do anything but stay here as I know with this tiny house for the rest of my life, and plant my little garden and smoke my little weed, I'm perfectly fine. So it's nothing that there, it's nothing that anybody can do anymore. Unless they would come take my property. That's it. That's the only thing you can do that would hurt me. You know, so as uh, long as I keep my taxes paid, which I can go work a job right here in the town and get me a nice little job at the hotel or wherever they need me to work, um, I'll be fine. Uh, so that right there can I can stay true because I like I don't need anything else. Like I said, I'm simple. I don't need anything else. So I'm not for sale. Um, and I'm just always going to go with the people because I know just how business works and corporations work. They go with what's hot and they go with what's smart for business, which is business. So I can't be mad at that. But I just know the people are going to support you and be down for you. The, the corporation or business didn't buy this property. They didn't help me pay for this property. They haven't supported me through my journeys or trips until I got the people behind me. Once I got enough people behind me, then they came because it's my business. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't mind doing business with companies, you know, here and there, but it's never going to be a I'm rushing to do this or I'm going to jump through any hoops or I'm going to trade who I am as a person or be downplayed. It's never that's never going to happen. Not for a dollar sign. I think it's been interesting. And I know that you spoke a little bit about this. 
a lot of corporations are like kind of tokenizing black athletes, people who are working in the outdoor sports and not willing to pay what they would like maybe a white athlete. And you've really spoken out about that. And I wondered if you wanted to talk at all about that. It's about, uh, again, information. Um, it's about information. That's why I'm like, I'm one of the only ones I see in the community that will share the information. Like I'm the only one that'll post any type of numbers or anything or be, cause some people are going, people are scared to post their numbers or rates where they get paid because they don't want to feel like overpaid or underpaid. It's a few different reasons, you know, whatever. Um, so it's that, or scared to lose sponsors or whatever, scared to speak out, scared to say certain things. So, I mean, you gotta have everybody on kind of like one accord. It's kind of hard to move with people moving a certain way, you know, um, but I guess you always gonna have that. Everybody's not always gonna be with the movement of trying to get paid with their word for, or get um, the rights that they need or whatever the case may be, whatever your cause is. Um, so you're never gonna have everybody on the same page. It's almost like a competitive kind of industry or space. And I think that they've made it so that people are scared to post their rates because they won't get hired again. But then what that does is then like there's just total ambiguity. And how do you even know what to set your rates at? Yeah, um, that's the once again, because no, no one shares this information. Like I don't try to talk to people behind the scenes and like, you know, you just can't get that information. You know I mean, because once again, like it's... It, Self, you know, everybody's self-serving and when it comes to the business part of the industry. So people are not going to try to tell you and give you the upper leg on them because they know, well, maybe I got a short shelf life or whatever the case they might be going on in their head. You know what I mean? So I'm just not scared of losing anything. I'm who I am when the camera's on, when the camera's off. So I'm going to be me. Like, I don't care if y'all sponsor these trips. I don't care what y'all do. Like, I'm still going to make it happen, you know, um, and that's just how it's going to go. You know, I'll figure out a way to make it happen. Um, so, and and once they kind of, I don't know, if, if you, you just got to move that way. You just got to move a certain way, I think, and uh, trust it. Just trust the process because uh, it's going to be, it's a process. It's just like you building this house. It's like you having a vision and then actually following through with that vision and doing something that a lot of people are too scared or feel like they can't do. And just like being really open and saying anybody can do this. <laughs> I'm really not. I'm not too too super special. Like everything I'm doing, I'm doing like on the wing. Um, so even if I'm doing it wrong and I had to do it two or three times and fix it and whatever the case, we figure it out. You know, it's just kind of it's kind of like that's just life. You know, um, people yeah. that people that fail the most probably succeed the most. I would think. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think that like willingness or that ability to fail like oftentimes we're told that we need a safety net right like a financial safety net in order to not take a leap and that is true in a lot of ways you can make yourself much more at risk but it's by failing that you like learn all of the lessons and move through and almost like the idea of this financial safety net is like a thing that keeps people from being able to believe in themselves Cause when do you reach it? I mean, what is the safety net? I mean, cause once you get a certain amount, you can say, oh man, I can use a little more. And then, oh, I can use a little more. Cause as you're making that safety net or you're building that amount of money, your expenses are gonna go up cause your quality of life is going up just a little bit cause you've been able to save money. So it's just, I mean, it's, it goes hand in hand. So it's never gonna be enough, you know? So I don't know, you gotta just like, once again, what's really, really important to you is it peace of mind for real people like oh I want peace of mind oh, I would love to live in the cabin in the woods but the what it takes a lot of people just not willing to do that even though the things are when you look at them they're kind of simple to do simple just throw all that stuff that you don't use away or donate it somebody needs it like you don't need all that stuff you got all these dirty pots and pans you don't use you know you got all this kitchen stuff you don't use you got all this stuff in this closets you don't use you know it's just too much stuff Americans just consume stuff that's just what we do you know, we, we find a sale here, we buy this, we get a Christmas gift, we get all these presents, you know, like, so we just got tons of stuff that we don't use and we don't need. So, like, in, I'm pretty sure everybody could downsize at least half of what their life is. Even if they got a 2,000 square foot, they can downsize to 1,000. I'm pretty sure, you know, and they got storage buildings all across America. So, there you go.
Well, and once you have stuff, then you like don't want to leave your stuff. It also becomes like a security blanket that makes you kind of fearful to go into environments that maybe don't feel as familiar. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your through hike on the Appalachian Trail. I know you said you were really in tune with nature, obviously, when you're out in nature, living in nature for that long. And you spoke a little bit about the effects of climate change that you saw along the trail, particularly the trees that had all died. And I'd I'd love for you to kind of talk about that because you were so connected there during that trip. Oh, yeah, because coming through like the Smokies, uh, where it's like the beetles, they got the invasive species over there. Then they got, uh, they had some wildfires, which some of them were like intentional. Um, That were really bad when I I came through there. Someone had set a really bad fire through the Smokies. uh, So... Just that being able to see the change of the of the terrain, the land, uh, how it was supposed to be. Like if if I'm up in, like it's October now, um, and I know the mornings are like 30s uh, here where I'm at in Maine. Uh, but when I was up here, it was a little bit warmer. Uh, you know, just for it to be October in the Northeast, it shouldn't have been that hot. It seemed like to me. Um, just that type of thing. You can like just tell the difference of of, of the weather patterns, how dry it is. Uh, that type of thing, like the seasons are shorter and they're a little bit out of, seem like they're out of whack. Like, a, you know, the, like the timing is off for the seasons or whatever. Um, but it's like the summer is getting longer and longer. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. And like hurricane season and all that kind of stuff is getting longer and longer. Like even since I've been up here, like the weather has been insane um, for the past few months. And I said, well, I was thinking well, if, I, if I moved to Maine, only thing I got to worry about is snow. Cause I'm away from the wildfires and I'm away from the hurricanes and I'm away from this, that, uh, tornadoes and all that stuff. So, but then I didn't realize I got like three different weather systems that are like smashing me at one time. I got the, I got the stuff coming from, uh, Canada that's coming across and I'm like, Oh, I forgot about that. And then I got the, like the tail end of all the hurricanes. I'm still getting those too. Yeah. And then the stuff that's coming up through, the, uh, like the, across the West and then coming up through the East, uh, across, the, you know, the Eastern seaboard, I'm getting that too. I'm like, Oh man. So yeah, I just been getting smashed. So that wasn't wise. That was like the worst part of my whole entire decision. As far as like placement and everything else, I think I pretty much nailed. But uh, yeah, we, we, it'll be all good. Once it gets cold enough to snow, then I don't mind it. I can kick back in the snow. It's all good. If you haven't seen it, this would be a good, odd thing to watch. It's called Dead River Rough Cut. I think it's a PBS documentary from like the 1970s. And it's of these two guys that live in the North Main woods and they hunt beavers And it is the most requested documentary at the Maine State Prisons, which is a very odd fact. But it is absolutely fascinating. It's these two guys who went back to the land, and it's them talking about their decisions behind it. And there's one, like, very kind of, to me, a very memorable scene where he's on a snowmobile, but the snowmobile doesn't have a seat. And it has, like, a circle bowl or something, and he builds a fire in it to warm his booty <laughs> while, he's, um, while he's going through the wow. snow <laughs> and um, it was just such a amazing and kind of fascinating film and they actually like the guys in it say some really philosophical interesting things I do think that people that like decide to pull kind of away from you know modern conveniences larger society big city it's like because of this kind of tune in and observation of what isn't serving us. Man, we all got a a thirst for like adventure. That's why people love what I got going on because it's the thirst for adventure. And they like, okay, maybe they, like I said, tied into their mortgage or whatever the case. They can't leave right just yet. They want to and they want to do something, but they they love watching me do it because they like, all right, he can go do it right now. That's cool. You know, um, especially with this right here is now it's tangible that they can come visit. You know, so it's, I think it's it's that people, you know, we used to be, this is what we used to doing, humans. You know, it's only in like the last hundred years that we moved into this era of like living just super cities and stuff. Like, yeah, you've always had cities, but most people live rural, you know, and that's just kind of what it is. Even America, if you really look at it, besides the major cities, it's rural, you know. Maine, I don't even know, I, mean, I think we got like what, a million people here or something like that. That's not a lot. That's like Charlotte, North Carolina. So like, so where I just came from, one city, 
you know. So, but outside of those major cities like that, America is pretty rural. I've, I took a like 10,000 mile road trip last year and I was all across the West. It's pretty wide open. Like Utah is pretty wide open besides Salt Lake City. And so once we realize that and once we realize everywhere ain't 24 seven convenient, People, are, people, I think are starting to lean towards their way. I think people are starting to realize, you know, they kind of can slow it, slow it down. Um, and I think like the food shortages and toilet paper shortages and stuff like will show you things like that. We let you know, like, oh wait a minute, I don't even know where my food comes from. You know, oh wait a minute, what if it, what if the trucks did stop today? If those eighteen wheelers stop moving for two days, everybody, everything will stop. Like, yeah. so um, just being able to come here and try to con. I'll set that. Yeah, I'm, I've still been all in town at Hannaford's buying my groceries and stuff because I had a short season this year, but I was able to grow a lot of tomatoes. I was able to check the land. I was able to grow a couple carrots and see what works here and what doesn't work here and see, okay, what well, maybe I can do next year and what I have to clear off. And as more people come, we learn the land and that'll take years for us to learn the land and, you know, um, but it, I think it all work. And once we get goats up here and rabbits and chickens and stuff like that, and we're just raising our own, um, we know where our food comes from. It's natural, you know, and it's just, I, I think that's a better quality of life for me and whoever would like to live, you know, I mean, it's, just, it's simpler, it's simpler. So say that somebody's listening right now and they're hearing the words that you're saying and they're just really connecting and they're thinking, wow, Daniel's really speaking to a lot of the things that I feel and have been thinking about. What would you say to them on, you know, the best ways to either support what you're doing here now or come and be a part of what you're doing here now or maybe even create something like this on their own somewhere? Oh, uh, well, um, I would say definitely reach out, um, you know, anywhere on my social medias, uh, Black Alachian, uh everywhere at Instagram. That's probably the best way to reach out to me on Instagram at the Black Alachian. Um you know, just try to tap in with me. I try to answer your question. Whatever you got, just be direct with your question, and I'm going to answer it, you know, uh, for you. For and, and that's no issue. You know, I try to respond to everybody that, that reaches out. Um, you know, if you want to support this, you know, I guess that, you know, reach out there. Um, as far as wanting to do something like this on your own, again, like I said, reach out, I'll help you, I'll give you the resources I had. Like I said, I'm just, I'm learning on the fly, you know, so I'll tell you whatever I learn, I'll point you in the right direction. I will say, uh, YouTube will tell you a lot, you know, that's where I go for all my, my education. I go to YouTube and I watch a ton of them and I filter the information and take what I need from them, um, you know, and try to just go from there and, and use it, apply it to what I need. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's the best way to reach out to me. Just you know, Instagram at the Black Alachian or my website theblackalachian.com. You can go on there and check out uh, what I got. You got the homestead fund there um, if you want to donate or anything like that. Uh, and just just tap in with me and uh, you know see about coming up and checking it out. You know, definitely wanna wanna have some people up next year to visit and just see what we got going on. Um, it's not gonna I'm not gonna be. Uh, Charging for no car workshops, a thousand dollars a day, like a week or whatever. No, we're not doing that. So, uh, you know, just chill vibes, just chill vibes with chill people, and you know, hopefully, everybody, you know, once once they once they look on my Instagram or my Facebook or whatever the case, then they'll probably get a you know good feel of who I am. I know that you lost your father, and building this in some ways is this legacy that you are carrying on those dinner table conversations that you have with him about doing this. And I'd love for you to just picture, you know, maybe like the next 20 years from now, what you want to build as legacy for your own family and for just greater humanity. I think, I think this is it. Uh, just me showing, showing people Land ownership, I think that's the most important thing you can do in life. I mean, they can say, oh, well, no one owns the earth and all that, but hey, it's a fact that you need to own property. I mean, it's just, a, it's just a way of life. That way you can control your destiny. That's the only way to freedom to me is ownership. If you don't own anything, how are you, how are you free? Because everywhere you walk, someone owns. 
Can't nobody come tell me to move from here or get off of here or anything. Can't nobody come say anything. And just being able to try to pass whatever knowledge I have on to help people get some type of ownership of whatever it is, whether it be a business or whatever type of information. That's the most important thing to me is ownership and just information. Um, that's why I just try to sit around and, and learn anything I can learn. That's why I watch all these videos and I go, you know, I got books and I got all this and I listen to people and I, you know, and I just seek information. Uh, and, and I think that's what it's all about. Ownership, information and, and traveling. You know, that's been kind of like the, that's, that's my themes. That's what, that's what I'm into, you know, just trying to pass, pass that along to people and, and show that it can be cool, show you can do it a different way, show you ain't gotta be rich doing it. Like I did a lot of these trips without much money. You know, it's only been a couple of them that have been sponsored where I haven't had to worry about any money, which is a blessing. And you make that a fun, di different type of trip. And you know, it's like, so, but people been able to watch me struggle and watch me triumph and all that. And I think that's just, that's very important to, to see. Um, so that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Just continue in, in that vein. Um, as much as possible and you know uh, like I say we just we'll see how it goes I figure in, in 20 years this place will look totally different in five years it'll look totally different um, and it'll all be from from hard work you know and from just like-minded people just cool people you know and it won't and it's not and it will never be about a dollar bill well, I'm really excited to see this continue to take shape and I really appreciate you like welcoming me on this journey and sharing your story with everyone and all of quite frankly the wisdom that you have gleaned in your life. I think that you on these journeys, these adventures that you've taken reconnecting with the earth, you have like evolved into like being able to see where we should be going versus where we are going and this is like a very intentional zig to the zag and i just love that so many people are supporting and following your journey that's the start that's the kernel but then it's inspiring and that helps people embolden them to break out of those patterns and maybe pursue a better quality of life for themselves even if it doesn't feel like what maybe our like consumer based culture tells us is the best quality of life so thank you so much Thank you for listening to my conversation with Daniel White. Wow, what an absolutely inspiring human being. I love the vision that Daniel has for the future and his lack of pretense for his monumental achievements thus far. He is a person of action, a person who has realized that the people that succeed the most often also fail the most and then are able to brush themselves off and try again. I think so many of us have these little voices in our heads that tell us we can't do this or we can't do that. But I hope listening to Daniel's wisdom and story helps inspire you to step out of your comfort zone and work towards whatever you want to manifest or change in your own life. Fear of the unknown and fear of being uncomfortable is a powerful deterrent on a path to greater happiness and self-reliance. Daniel has had the courage to take control of his destiny and work towards his own vision of a life well lived. That hasn't been the easy route in any regard, but it is one he is committed to and one I know he will be successful in. In this modern day and age, each one of us has the power to share our stories and to connect with like-minded people across the globe. I encourage you to follow Daniel's journey and consider contributing to the build out of Zion North. You can find photos from my visit to Daniel's homestead and links to his website, social media, and crowdfunding campaign on the blog by visiting urbanexodus.com. Hi friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Urban Exodus podcast. Urban Exodus is a labor of love and is only made possible by listener support. I do this work because the people I meet through this project give me energy and hope for the future. My mission is to promote the work of people manifesting good in the world. 
We are living in a time where there's an overwhelming feeling of dread, and I want this project to encourage people to be proactive and work towards finding creative solutions for both their individual happiness and our collective experience. You can support this work by clicking the support button at the top of urbanexodus.com, by buying an ad spot in an upcoming episode, by shopping our online store, or taking an in-person or online course through our workshops at Howhill Farm. We are also slowly getting our Patreon page together and we'll be adding bonus features and other content there. So check out patreon.com slash urban exodus to learn more. Another way to support is by giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and recommending Urban Exodus to your friends. Thank you again for helping me continue to do this work. I couldn't do it without all of you. You can find Urban Exodus on Instagram and Facebook at The Urban Exodus. To read more in-depth features on folks who ditched the city and went country, visit urbanexodus.com. Until next time, I'm Alyssa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus. Urban Exodus.